Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Joining us today is Julian Sanchez, senior fellow at the Cato Institute, and guest hosting for Aaron is Matthew Feeney, policy analyst here at the Cato Institute. Today's topic is the NSA and domestic surveillance. So my first question is, I guess, just to set the stage, uh, haven't Governments been spying on us forever. Isn't that just what we do, what we do with governments? We expect them to spy on us. You know what's what happened before and what's new now. Sure. So spying is of course ancient. One of the very first and most simple secret codes is called the Caesar shift. That's uh, when you know you you write a C instead of A and D instead of B uh, because uh, the Caesar and ancient Roman generals used it uh, to send coded messages. So spying is uh, certainly as old as as governments and human conflict. One of the things that's new, however, is the capability to, in effect, spy on entire populations wholesale. That is really something that is novel with the age of computers and electronic communications. It's always been possible to try and intercept particular communications or spy on particular people. But the idea that, in effect, you could have a vacuum cleaner siphoning up and, in some way, analyzing um, not just the communication of the entire population, but massive uh, databases about their activities, activities in many cases that that never in the past left any kind of permanent record. Um, when you think about uh, reading or having conversations, uh, these are activities that used to not leave any particular trace. If you weren't following someone when they took a particular uh, trip on the road, had a particular meeting, um, opened a book or a magazine, um, you had no way of tracking that after the fact, let alone correlating the activities of thousands or millions of people to look for patterns in those activities. So that's all quite novel. Um, and In fact, we see, I think, uh, in some of the revelations about modern spying, uh, something that is really, I think, new to our constitutional tradition. So right there in the Fourth Amendment is the idea that searches and seizures, not just for intelligence purposes and for spying, but certainly especially in uh, criminal investigations, uh, are particularized. You become suspicious of a particular person and then you attempt to read their mail, look through their papers. Um, you know, maybe you break into their house and look for evidence. Um, but the idea was that this is something you did on in an individualized basis once there was some uh, kernel of suspicion attached to that person. And what we see, uh, I think, in the revelations about modern NSA spying is a shift from retail to wholesale surveillance, a shift from a model where you become suspicious about a particular person and then surveil their communications to a model where you surveil the communications of entire populations in order to develop grounds for suspicion. This uh, seems like it came at a an uh, interesting confluence of events because not only did we have the technology grow, the internet, the digital life grow, but then 9-11, yep. not coincidentally at the same time. So then there was both the means and the motive to do those things simultaneously. In, in a way, we have a kind of three-way perfect storm of a lot of different kinds of uh, capabilities and political background facts uh, coming into confluence at the same time. Uh, so on the one hand, we have the technological capability to analyze vast reams of data, which is relatively new. Um, the regime for uh, legally governing American intelligence spying uh, has its origins in scandals of the mid-1970s, late 1960s um, that led to the passage of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978. One of these was uh, an illicit NSA program called Shamrock that involved uh, mass analysis of international telegrams and looking for keywords, in a way a predecessor to what's being done on a much larger scale today. Um, then it was quite impressive that NSA was able to analyze at the peak many thousands or hundreds of thousands of telegrams, uh, perhaps in uh, a single month. Uh, but we're now talking about uh, you know, millions of communications a day being automatically siphoned and, and filtered uh, for uh, profile matches or matches to particular targets. So one aspect of this is uh, the ability to essentially – surveil communications in mass, which was impossible before. The other aspect or another aspect is a change in the nature of the enemy. 
um, intelligence in particular, where certainly in, under U.S. law and most countries uh, has always been understood to be uh, a domain where the rules are a bit looser than with respect to ordinary criminal investigation. And there's some good reasons for that. It's more difficult basically to deal with uh, state actors, uh, the people with the backing of foreign states who have the ability to flee the country and sophisticated uh, intelligence tradecraft. Um, but the nature of the enemy is no longer that you you have a sort of a fixed known entity, you know, a foreign state um, who is communicating on separate facilities, uh, you know, secure communications channels, and so that you know who you're trying to target. In a way, because the enemy is these decentralized terrorist groups that are embedded in civilian populations, um, you have a shift in the mission along with the shift in technology. Um, so it's not just to figure out what the enemy is doing but to detect who the enemy is. And then the third shift, uh, not in the analytic capabilities but the technological shift to a global communications network where not just – Enemy communications and civilian communications are mixed on the very same network, but also borders don't matter nearly as much. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act was written on the assumption that if you had pretty strict rules or you know, stricter rules for surveillance that was carried out within the United States, uh, you didn't have to worry that much about uh, restricting the ability of the spy agencies to spy outside the United States because the thought was you would occasionally but relatively rarely end up picking up a lot of American communications when you were uh, tapping a phone line in, uh, in Germany or in Russia. Uh, but of course, that's no longer true and the, the NSA folks themselves will tell you a big part of the challenge they face in the 21st century is that a communication uh, between New York and Los Angeles, for instance, in the modern era might travel – through Japan, if it's in the middle of the day when the pipes are congested in the U.S., <laughs> uh, but everyone in Asia is asleep, the cheapest way for that communication to go might be not through the United States but through Asia. Uh, if you think about uh, uh, services like Google and Facebook, uh, it may be that because they're trying to serve a global user base, um, the database of private information that you think is just on a server somewhere in Palo Alto is actually also backed up in full – in, uh, on backup servers in Ireland or in China um, with the result that, as we now know, um, under the much looser authority of Executive Order 12333, which handles surveillance outside the United States. And who issued that one? Uh, that's, so the original Executive Order 12333 was signed by Ronald Reagan in the early 1980s. Again, it was meant to provide guidance and authority for intelligence activities not in the United States. And the, the assumption was that really meant spying on foreigners. But again, as we now know, um, in fact, vast, vast amounts of surveillance, including surveillance that sweeps in Americans' communications, is now done by um, – well, there was a program called Muscular, for instance, that involved basically tapping the data links between these huge backup servers, companies like Google and Yahoo maintained overseas. And when they were doing that, they were effectively unrestricted by the rules that are meant to govern – uh, the acquisition of Americans' communications. When they're doing it in bulk, they get to say, well, we're not targeting any particular American. We're just getting all the data. Uh, and of course, that includes many Americans' communications or other kinds of remotely stored files and private data. Um, and so these three factors, the ability to analyze data in bulk, uh, the emergence of an enemy that blends into civilian populations and uses civilian communications networks, and uh, a global network technology that makes borders increasingly irrelevant um, have generated this scenario where the intelligence agencies feel this imperative to, as their internal documents say, collect it all. Uh, and under old rules that are not really that well adapted to ensure that collecting it all doesn't mean collecting huge amounts of the private data of their own citizens. Well, uh, I think uh, a lot of people might be uh, wondering what uh, the, the intelligence community says quite often, which is, well, if we need to find a needle, we need to look at the haystack and that the tools that they use only work with bulk collection. Uh, number one, is that true? And also, how effective has this been? Well, so I mean, in a way, the answer to those are, 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 are I think, the same answer. Um, this is the, you know, sometimes the, the, the kind of jokey 
response to this is look, this is the attempting to find a needle in a haystack by gathering even more hay. Right. Um, intelligence professionals themselves often refer to the problem of what they call drinking from a fire hose, uh, having so much data pouring in that they are unable to process it meaningfully or, or figure out the difference between um, you know genuine suspicious patterns and coincidental suspicious patterns because if you have enough dots, you can you can draw patterns that look like something suspicious through them. Um, I think if we look back, for example, first to the 9-11 report and the findings uh, about the causes of the intelligence failure that led to 9-11, you'll find there that the problem was not inadequate raw collection of data. Um, the famous phrase from that report, the failure to connect the dots, has, has since I think been very badly spun and misconstrued. So now we hear advocates of more surveillance power saying, well, you can't connect the dots unless you collect all the dots or as many dots as you can. Um, but as it turns out, that, that is not really a recipe for, for greater efficacy. Um, the finding of the 9-11 Commission was in fact that they had the data but failed to collate it, not that they needed more data to collate. And if you look at the track record of a lot of the uh, bulk collection programs since then, we find a not very impressive history here. We had two independent panels, the President's Handpicked Surveillance Review Group and the Privacy and Civil Liberties uh, Oversight Board do a pretty detailed review of this bulk telephony uh, call records program where they were sweeping up the call records of base of at least at one point nearly um, all Americans domestic international communications um, and they found that it was essentially never useful in catching a terror suspect or thwarting an attack um, that in almost every case they were merely duplicating information that the FBI had already obtained through targeted Authorities, um, which I mean, it shouldn't be that surprising that that in fact trying to collect and sort through huge amounts of data about millions of innocent people um, is often just not going to be worth the investment relative to the sort of time-tested method of once you're suspicious of someone, focusing your energy and your resources on analyzing their data. Um, it's a little bit harder to say with respect to some of these other intelligence programs about which we know less. Um, and which have not been subject to the same kind of searching review. Um, but if we look back to the original warrantless wiretap program under um, uh, under President Bush, we find that when the inspector generals looked at the results of that, they found basically the same thing, that to the extent useful intelligence was obtained there, it was almost always uh, about people who were already targeted by the FBI with specific traditional – Warrants. Um, we find the same thing in some of the Senate reports on fusion centers, which are supposed to sweep up and, and synthesize large amounts of data that they basically never uh, provide any useful, uh, timely intelligence. So when someone says that this is stopping terrorist attacks or has stopped terrorist attacks, that's a very – at the, at the least dubious assertion? Well, certainly the programs that have been looked at the most carefully, that those assertions have not held up. It would be hard to say with respect to some of the others. So for example, the, um, the FISA 702 program. This is not metadata but the acquisition of contents. One sorry. Metadata is a, is a term we, we need to define yes. uh, before we continue. So metadata is, is actually kind of a, um, a dubious term. Uh, people talk sometimes as though it, it – uh, there's some kind of clear natural distinction between the content of a communication and the metadata. In fact, the, the distinction is much blurrier, especially on the internet. But the idea here is um, the metadata is the data about the communication. So if we have a phone call, the phone number I dialed and how long the call took, that kind of information that would be on your phone bill is the metadata and the content of the communication is what we actually said over the phone. Um, but of course – how you categorize these things is uh, um, you know, to some extent a matter of choice even on traditional phone networks. I call an office building and I tell the secretary I'd like to be connected to Trevor or to extension 320 um, or perhaps it's an automated system and I punch in 320 for the extension. Well, is that the content of the call or just more metadata? Well, it's, it gets blurry and more so when you think of something like a website. Well, I go to cato.org slash 
surveillance uh, or something like that. Um, it gives you a pretty idea of exactly what content I'm looking at. Uh, it is formally metadata. Uh, and with internet communications, actually, there's a whole nested layer, almost like a layers of an onion of content and metadata. So that your, your computer sends to the website and the website sends back so, to your computer. So, right? So, right. So and those are the packets? Is that, is that the right Yeah, packets is sort of right, the, 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 the basic unit of information flow on the internet. And it, it, you can actually make much the same analogy I did to the, um, you know, calling up an office and asking the secretary to connect you to, um, to a particular line. Um, uh, you know, a packet of data will contain so let's say I send an email to Trevor at Cato. Uh, there'll be an outer layer of metadata that the ISP needs to see that Comcast, for example, looks at that just says this packet is going to Cato's server. And then when it, once it lands on Cato's, Cato's server, that packet has content that says deliver – this is a mail message and please deliver it to Trevor's mailbox. And so that's metadata for my mail message but the content of the kind of outer layer – um, that just said, take this to Cato. And then within that, of course, is the contents of the actual message. Um, and there's this sense uh, that defenders of some of these surveillance programs like to spread that metadata is somehow trivial. It's not that important. Um, and in a way, if you think about an individual communication, maybe that sounds plausible. Sure, I call up a, a particular phone number and unless I'm calling a suicide hotline or an abortion clinic or uh, an AA number – um, probably the information about the phone number is less revealing than what I actually say on the call. But when you take that at the macro scale and you say not just one phone number or one email address but the whole pattern um, over the course of many days or weeks or months – of my communications, of what websites I visit, of what I read, at what times of day and in what locations and not just what I'm doing but how my patterns of behavior change over time. Am I staying up later? Do I seem uh, disturbed? Am I looking at different things now or talking to different people? Um, and also the patterns relative to the entire population, uh, not just what does my metadata say but is my metadata unusual? Is it changing in ways that look different than a normal person's? Is it changing in the same way as people who uh, become interested in radical interpretations of Islam? Um, once you have that kind of bulk database to analyze, uh, the, the metadata can in fact become as or more revealing than the content of the communications because in, in many cases, it's, um, it's actually much easier to analyze uh, very quickly huge amounts of metadata than it is to um, chug through entire communications. And from what we know about the NSA, do we know that they are doing this for all of us domestically, tracking this in large groups of people within the United States? Well, so exactly what kinds of data they're gathering are, uh, are hard to know. The, we know that the telephone program, which is still in effect but is sort of slated for reform, um, was to the largest and most indiscriminate collection of data about Americans' communications. And that was at the PRISM program? That's a separate. Oh. So the metadata, uh, the metadata acquisition is under an authority – um, it's usually identified with the, the Patriot Act. It's a power that was expended under Section 215 of the Patriot Act in 2001. That's an authority to acquire records that are relevant to an investigation. I think the idea originally uh, was, of course, um, when you're investigating a particular entity, maybe you think this particular charity is actually a front group to fund foreign terrorists. Once you're investigating this person or this corporation or this entity, um, you would be able to get lots of documents that were relevant to the activities of whoever you were investigating or perhaps uh, associates or people in contact with the target of your investigation so you could uh, figure out whether this required further scrutiny. Um, the FISA court established by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act allowed uh, the NSA to effectively say – Everything is relevant to the investigation but because by creating this large database, they can later analyze at will and, and, uh, and connect the dots between uh, lots of different people who communicate with each other. Um, they would be able to provide useful uh, um, analysis for investigations. That's certainly not an understanding that ever before I think courts have had of what relevance means in, in laws like this that permit 
you to obtain records. Um, but that was something they were able to sell. They had also sold the court on a similar program, now discontinued but probably being conducted under different authorities that did the same thing for international uh, internet communications. So at the very least, inter- all international emails, perhaps also international web traffic. Um, and, and keep in mind here, you probably have no idea when you're engaged in an international internet communication. I mean, you, you may if you're deliberately visiting the BBC website. Um, but maybe that website has a mirror in Atlanta, Georgia, and maybe – Again, given the, the time of day and the facts about congestion, um, you, you're visiting a Facebook page. But it, in fact, um, the cheapest path for uh, your bits to travel is to a server in Ireland. Um, so you probably have a lot more of those international communications than, um, than you think you do. Well, but uh, something that's always occurred to me while, while these revelations have come up is that uh, even if you accept that the metadata is good for – uh, targeting or investigating terrorism and all the rest of it. There have also been revelations that the American intelligence community has spied on German politicians and even spied in the Vatican conclaves. I mean, how how is this uh, supposedly justified given that I don't think you know, the, the Pope is necessarily a threat to U.S. national security and Germany is an ally? Uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, so another, I think, pattern we've seen since uh, 9-11 really is – that authorities the intelligence community has wanted for a long time, uh, often for general support to their broader intelligence mission, which is certainly not limited to terrorism, um, are justified in terms of its utility for counterterrorism, um, which is not necessarily the primary way they're used. Maybe the most famous example of this are the so-called sneak and peek searches that were part of the Patriot Act. These were um, explicit authority and the courts have always allowed these in extraordinary circumstances but this was a, a, a clearer and, and an easier uh, authority to enable ordinary investigators, not necessarily for intelligence uh, cases, to get a search warrant that would allow them to surreptitiously break into a, a home or other location uh, and only notify the homeowner much later. Uh, the usual model, of course, is that come to the door or maybe knock down the door, but they, they come at the time they serve it, show the person that they have legal authority to search, um, conduct the search. The person can sort of monitor and make sure that they're uh, essentially taking only what they're supposed to take. Um, and the person is, is in a position to complain if, if they do something wrong. Uh, sneak and peek searches were sold as something that was necessary to avoid tipping off terrorists, even though, of course, there's a separate and completely secret physical search authority that's part of FISA. Um, the thought, though, was this was something that you know ordinary police needed to assist in counterterrorism investigations. And, of course, a few years later, it became clear that almost never was this authority used uh, in counterterrorism investigations. It was used overwhelmingly for uh, drug and, uh, and other kinds of investigations. Uh, so what we need to bear in mind when we think about all the authorities that have been justified since 9-11 as necessary to fight terrorism is that very rarely are the statutory terms of these power restricted to counterterrorism. So I, I mentioned earlier 702. This is one of the ones that may have been more useful, that may actually have been helpful in, uh, in foiling terror attacks or, or actually gathering information about terrorists. Um, this is an authority that permits the government without a warrant. It's effectively a general warrant that allows uh, the director of national intelligence and the attorney general to issue certifications that cover broad categories of intelligence targets like foreign terror groups or – uh, foreign cyber attackers and then lets the NSA basically decide which accounts, which phone lines, which email addresses uh, they're specifically going to subject to search and wiretapping and collection. Um, this is always discussed as a counterterrorism tool. But of course, if you look at the statute, um, it doesn't say the NSA or the government may spy on foreign terrorists. It says uh, essentially if the purpose is to gather foreign intelligence – of any kind, including plans about what Angela Merkel is going to do at the next uh, you know, round of treaty negotiations, and the target is outside the United States, so you know, Angela Merkel at Germany.de or whatever, um, then NSA can be authorized to do this without further judicial approval. And so we know now they have um, you know, essentially 
many, many tens of thousands of targets every year. Um, and since targets including corp- corporations, that might mean you know many hundreds of thousands of specific accounts being spied upon. Um, and surely some of those are uh, suspected terrorists or people involved in terrorism. Um, but that's not a requirement of the statute. And we know that one of the things they do, for instance, is uh, spy on foreign network administrators, people who work in IT, people who maintain um, computer networks, not because they're suspected of doing anything wrong, but because you never know when you might need to spy on a network that some target is using. So you spy on the network administrator, um, learn all the things they might be using as their password, use that information to be able to compromise their accounts and own uh, their entire network. They don't have to be terrorists. They just have to be someone who is not in the United States. But the 702 program, according to some accounts, has – numerous protections on it, attorney general approval, director of national intelligence approval, FISA court approval, which are usually topical certifications rather than individualized certifications, congressional oversight, committee congressional briefings, congressmen can make hay if they want to make hay. Uh, And there's also – they have to submit I think reports every 90 days about the activity. And on some accounts, the error rate is incredibly low and and below 1 percent of – and they self-report their errors on these things. Uh, How do you respond to those levels of of, of you know, prophylaxis about make, having this be abused. Right. Um, so I, I think it's important to understand uh, that the scale of a program like this, where again they're sweeping in millions or tens of communi- uh, communications on a daily basis, makes oversight that's meaningful quite difficult. Um, and indeed, the, the judges on the FISA court have said, and they, they certainly have an oversight role here. They are the ones who approve the broad procedures under, uh, under which 702 surveillance operates. Remember again, 702 phone and internet surveillance where there are these broad sort of general warrants, but then the NSA itself is uh, the entity that, that gets to decide who is actually spied on. And the FISA court is responsible for uh, approving the procedures they say they're going to use. These are the criteria we're going to expect analysts to meet um, before they start tapping a particular email account or uh, IP address or phone line. Um, this is the methods that they're going to use to try and ensure that they're not uh, tapping anyone inside the United States. But the FISA court judges have acknowledged that they cannot meaningfully review the actual implementation of this program. And yeah, there are um, – routine reviews of uh, how this stuff is being used, but there are some difficulties. Um, One is, just again, because of the scale of it, um, you can only really look at a pretty tiny snapshot of what's of of what's actually being collected and used. I mean, the NSA itself probably never looks at most of the communications that are swept in. Um, Another problem is that it really seems like the oversight is is designed to catch – inadvertent um, sort of incorrect targeting. That is to say they, they're not bad at catching um, you know, a typo that, that uh, got flagged the wrong email account for surveillance. Um, it's not nearly as clear that they have a system that is well suited to catch people who understand how the system of oversight works and um, either as a sort of rogue analyst are deliberately circumventing those controls or the case where as – historically has often happened, um, at a fairly high level, the agencies themselves decide that they want to try and circumvent oversight. And I think the pattern you see um, pretty continually when the inspector general does poke into this or that program, it's hard to say with respect to 702 specifically, but a lot of these programs is that um, the agencies often have a very narrow idea of what kinds of violations have to be reported. Um, to the oversight entities. The inspector general often sort of suggests that there are lots of incidents that, that really probably should have been reported that the FBI didn't think were, uh, were significant enough to rise to the level of a reportable violation. Um, and frankly, the fact that so much is legal that it doesn't technically count as a violation. Um, so if you have some passable foreign intelligence reason to be collecting a lot of foreign data, um, of foreign communication streams. Let's say you're targeting an entity like WikiLeaks or the Pirate Bay. These are both examples that have been discussed. Um, the collection of lots of American communications 
incidentally, as they call it, is not a violation. They understand that you're supposed to be catch, uh, catching basically a lot of uh, American communications as long as you're not targeting the American. Um, and so if that's not a violation, if it's not a violation of the rules to have all these communications, um, the question of violation kind of comes down to what you're doing with it. Now that they've got all of our communications, are these being used in a way to uh, target or harass people or might they be used in that way in the future? And that ultimately comes down to what a person does with information what is his, once it has entered their brain. And that is a lot harder um, to enforce, especially again when you're talking about um, – the enormous quality of data being collected. So, you know, an embarrassing story uh, appears in the gossip pages about a political opponent of the president. Uh, did that information come from an email the NSA intercepted from someone else? Well, it's hard to say. Does the NSA even have that information? Well, you would have no way of knowing without then going back and looking through their uh, archives to see whether. Uh, that embarrassing column matched something that was in the database. And of course, you don't want to do that because that means searching for an American's uh, information in the database, which would itself be uh, you know, without an intelligence purpose. Um, if we look historically at the way abuse has occurred in the past, um, you know, the, the wiretapping of activists and civil rights leaders and anti-war uh, activists, um, we find that the agencies that had some sense that perhaps what they were doing was not appropriate, um, took steps to ensure that what they were doing would not be visible to overseers. Um, so very often these activities would be routed through alternate file systems to ensure that there was no record in the central FBI database of – You told me a story one time about the briefcase, delivering the briefcase to the house. That, that's a great story. On one, yeah, one of my favorite stories involves a former uh, congressman and senator, Carl Munt, uh, who used to write Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, um, semi-regularly uh, asking for intelligence about political opponents or other figures that uh, he was interested in. And invariably, Hoover would write back saying, no, the files of the FBI are confidential. I cannot share this, uh, this personal file with you, congressman uh, or senator. And a historian eventually became curious as to why Munt was so persistent. Why didn't he get the message? Uh, and as he eventually interviewed Munt's former personal secretary, um, he learned that the answer was that these letters of refusal from the bureau, from Hoover, would always come hand-delivered by an FBI agent who would also come with a briefcase containing the file Munt had asked for, open it up, lay it on the desk, say, i got to take this back with me. I can't give you the file, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have and you can take notes. Um, but, but that was Hoover though. We know he was bad, right? Right. And so <laughs> – you know, I, I, if, we don't think, if, we don't, if we don't think Hoover was a uniquely evil human being, um, the message we should take is, is that um, the people who are in charge of these agencies and who have access to this information understand that there's oversight and also understand that there are ways to avoid creating any records for the overseers to work with. In fact, what we now know about the abuses of the 60s and 70s under Hoover and under other uh, agencies um, – you know, comes from a very partial bit of the historical record. Historians later uncovered, you know, single routing slips, single pieces of paper from much larger files that had been destroyed, revealing other kinds of illegal break-ins and illegal wiretaps that uh, the congressional Investig uh, investigative committees had not discovered, um, and. The only evidence we have is basically something that was accidentally not destroyed, suggesting a larger archive of which these uh, slips were a part. Uh, so it's just given the scale of this, uh, even more so now when um, you're by design collecting so much stuff. At least, for example, in the in the seventies, a, a new attorney general discovered uh, a, a decades old bug that had been planted in the offices of the <laughs> Southern Christian Leadership Conference and sort of said, look, if there's not an actual criminal prosecution forthcoming, you better shut this off. Um, you have no legitimate reason to be, to be wiretapping these people. Um, but of course, it would no longer actually be a big red flag that, for instance, you know, Bill Clinton's emails are being sucked up. When you're collecting on this scale, um, the fact that some politically sensitive entity is being uh, is being collected on 
doesn't necessarily tell you that there's something amiss, um, that, the, that someone is using this for a nefarious purpose. It's, it's in, in a way easier to come up with excuses for why you have this sense of information. And you know, again, I think the pattern we see over time in a lot of different programs is the FISA court is informed that the NSA is, is running a program, is collecting data in a certain way, and then two or three years later, this has happened several times, uh, they learned that NSA had actually fundamentally misdescribed what was going on, that they were collecting much more information, that they were not observing uh, restrictions on searching the database that the court had tried to impose. In one case, they said that the elaborate system of restrictions that had uh, essentially allowed them to justify approving one of these collection programs had effectively never functioned because it had been so systematically disregarded. Um, members of Congress complain sometimes humorously about how difficult it is to extract information. Um, it often feels, they say, like a game of 20 questions. Um, and so, of course, you know, the, the picture they'll get are very brief summaries of something that's working very well and very effectively. Um, but again, it seems like what we see again and again is when there is greater scrutiny, um, things the overseers weren't aware of come to light and you realize in fact what a partial picture they have. I mean it does seem like senior members of the intelligence committees really believed that this telephone program, this tele telephone metadata collection program had been somehow instrumental in thwarting dozens of terrorist plots. Um, and as soon as the surface of that claim was scratched, it turned out it was, of course, completely false. Um, but it seems like, again, the senior legislators responsible for oversight genuinely believed it until there was pressure to dig deeper. Um, so I think that should be um, a little bit disturbing and should raise serious questions about how meaningful uh, this oversight mechanism really is or can be. Well, then what sort of reforms can or should we look forward to? Because you know, the, the NSA has had a big hit to its reputation in the wake of the Snowden leaks. But given uh, the stories you've just told about oversight and, well, I mean, frankly, lack of information at the top. And lack of tra it's, transparency. And a lack of transparency. It seems to me that even if it was announced that, OK, there's going to be a big overhaul of the American intelligence community, civil liberties will be taken more seriously. Um, I suppose the perhaps naive question might be, well, why trust them whenever they come out and announce these sort of things? That, that is not a bad question. Um, you know, in, in part, one of the curses of uh, intelligence is the, the in the sort of the, the academic scholarship about intelligence oversight. You you find this trope of fire alarm versus police patrol models, um, and they say that basically for the most part the American intelligence community has operated on a fire alarm model, meaning uh, essentially every now and then there's a scandal, um, either a huge intelligence failure or a huge intelligence abuse. Um, there is deep scrutiny of, uh, of their operations. Uh, sometimes corrections are made and then over time, the energy to scrutinize falls away. And I think you can understand why. Um, you know, Matthew, you said earlier, Congress can, can make hay if they discover something amiss. But actually, their ability to do that is pretty limited. Uh, I mean, Ron Wyden can get up and say, I don't think they're using their authority correctly. Um, he was obviously very uh, upset about this bulk metadata collection program or metadata collection programs, I should say, phone and internet um, for a long time, but wasn't able to say publicly exactly what he was so concerned about. Um, and more generally, you know, legislators have limited time and their ability uh, to, uh, you know, focus their, their resources, energy and time on this is sort of constrained because they have to think sort of politically speaking. If I fix a big problem internally to one of these agencies, I don't get to put out a press release later and sort of um, – trumpet what, what good I'm doing for my constituents' civil liberties, um, it makes a lot more sense to work on other areas, especially areas where you know, there are external groups and lobbyists that are sort of willing and able to help whatever the congressman is trying to do. Um, in the intelligence uh, you know, sort of arena, almost all the information you have is coming from inside the agencies themselves. Um, you get maybe external pressure from groups like the ACLU or the Electronic Frontier Foundation, but um, they rarely actually have details of, um, of of what's going on or specific suggestions about how it needs to be fixed. Um, that said, 
um, you know, you do see that there are limits. That is to say, um, they will twist often the authorities they're uh, they're given in ways that perhaps were not intended or obvious to the public in order to achieve whatever programs they think are necessary to allow them to do their their jobs and serve their intelligence functions. Um, but you, you do see them running again up against. You know legal strictures that there's no real way around, and and so um, if it's sort of clear enough what you're trying to prohibit them to do, and you don't leave loopholes, um, there's at least a sense that that someone will um, cry foul before um, before uh, before that gets too wildly out of hand. Um, but so I guess backing up, I think what is most important in terms of limiting the ability of these systems to be misused is not to think about uh, this particular program or that particular program and what the standard to get this kind of record should be, um, but to think in a broader sense about the creation of architectures of surveillance. That is to say, um, to look at the way the structure is set up and ask, um, if someone decided after an attack to ignore the rules, you know, either for a good reason in a moment of panic, what seemed like a good reason, or out of you know, sort of malice or desire to abuse the system. Um, how easy would it be? Could you just flip a switch and turn the system to uh, an inappropriate use? Uh, in a way, the metadata program we just discussed um, is one one example of what two different kinds of architectures for this might look like. Um, the president has basically already announced his intention to end that program in its current form, which involves basically um, sweeping in everyone's communications data and then analysts querying particular numbers um, and then all the numbers associated with them out or two degrees of, uh, or three degrees of separation um, from that master database. Uh, so it's like they have they their own little tip. Google. They right. Google the entire data. That, that, right. So the, two, it's like the intelligence committee wants to – Create a Google database of all of our private database that they that they can then Google effectively. Yeah, effectively. Now the alternate structure, which will allow them to do much of the same kind of analysis, is instead they're going to go to the FISA court, serve an order on the carriers uh, who, in sort of consortium, are going to work to um, you know sync up all their records so that I can get. You know, very quickly, if a Verizon customer called an AT and T customer and that person called a Sprint customer, um, I can sort of start with one number and get the the kind of pattern of that person's communications um, quickly without having to go back and forth between all the carriers, um, but still on an individualized basis, where I've given the FISA court, the secret FISA court, a list of phone numbers that I am suspicious of for some reason. Go to the carriers and say, "Okay, start giving us the feeds on these numbers." And the people in contact with them, and that ends up pretty quickly getting to a lot of different phone numbers that uh, they're having their metadata swept in. Um, but the important thing to to recognize about the difference between this architecture and that architecture is, under the bulk architecture, all the information's in house. And so, if you decide you want to look at the president's calling patterns or uh, you know that that annoying Cato Institute guy's calling patterns. Um, all you need is someone who's going to punch that number in at a keyboard in house. All the information is kept there, uh, and all they have to do is get around whatever internal mechanisms may be set up to, to raise a red flag if you're doing something weird. Um, under this alternate architecture. Uh, probably all those people's call records are not already in the system. So there are additional steps. You'd have to get the FISA court to sign off on it, get the information from the carrier, um, have it reviewed why that particular information was coming in. Um, these are two architectures that allow much the same kind of analysis. But as you can see, if you wanted to turn one architecture to um, some inappropriate purpose, like spying on your political opponents or um, or you know inconvenient activists. Uh, one architecture basically allows you to do that with the flip of a switch. Uh, another architecture makes it actually quite a bit more difficult to do that. Well, some some listeners might be thinking under under both architectures uh, might might be thinking to themselves, well. I've never visited WikiLeaks. I've never visited a jihadist website. I don't, you know, read dodgy books. I've never Googled how to build a bomb. So why be concerned about this? Uh, if if 
the, the justification for it is national security and I'm not a national security threat. Are you asking I, if you haven't done anything wrong? Yeah. Then, if, then if I've, I mean, what do you have to worry about? Unless you're one yeah. of these weird guys at CADA. Yeah. Then we should. I mean, in a, in a way, one answer to that is to ask about the effect of, a, of asking that question. That is to right, say, yeah. if your statement is, well, I don't have anything to worry about. I've never Googled how to build a bomb. I've never looked at Islamist videos on YouTube. Does that affect your likelihood in the future of doing those things? When you're sitting down to Google, is some part of your brain going to be thinking? Is every American's brain in some tiny corner going to be thinking, well, can I Google how to build a bomb or should I go to this Islamist website? Maybe not because I'm an Islamist, because I'm interested in reading about it, um, is something in the back of your head wondering whether uh, you're going to get on a list because um, you made a certain phone call or went to a certain website. Um, and we can look uh, at affidavits from um, a whole array of civil society groups from the NRA to uh, religious groups across the board um, saying that they encounter uh, – a lot of doubt and reluctance from their membership now. Um, people are worried about um, calling, let's say, a, a gun rights organization. They say, well, I, I may have a, um, a, a gun that's not legal and I'm not sure what to do about it. But I don't certainly, if this comes up, want it uh, on the record that I called um, for legal advice about this. Uh, and the other thing to note is, of course, that historically the point of surveillance has been to affect politics in a way that goes far beyond the particular people who are under surveillance. So um, you think about the, the notorious campaign that was waged against Martin Luther King. They essentially attempted to um, psychologically destabilize him and, and drive him out of public life by um, trying to blackmail him essentially with, with um, tapes of his extramarital liaisons. Um, obviously, if Martin Luther King is removed from political public life, that affects a lot of people other than Martin Luther King and his immediate family. Um, if, as we've learned, lots of Muslim civil society leaders, people who are uh, uh, you know, attorneys or, or uh, public advocates or activists from the Muslim community uh, were uh, under surveillance or uh, you know, potential uh, people who are interested in, in joining these communities are intimidated out of it because they're afraid that this will bring them under government scrutiny, um, that affects the balance of political power and it affects the kinds of public discussions we're able to have um, in a way that goes beyond the effect on the particular people who are scrutinized. Um, and again, you have to sort of recognize that when data is stored over long periods of time, um, one of the famous instances of this is that in his 20s, midshipman uh, John F. Kennedy had an affair with a German columnist who was sort of under monitoring by the FBI. Um, more than a decade later when he won the Democratic nomination on that very day, uh, the file concerning his affair with this uh, German columnist Inga Arvad was immediately moved to J. Edgar Hoover's personal and confidential file. Um, so the question to ask is not just, well, am I doing something wrong today or even how does the fact of the surveillance system you know, it disincentivize me to do anything that might be perceived as doing something wrong? But who is going to define wrong in five years or ten years? Um, and is the fact that I am reading Occupy websites today or Tea Party websites today going to be considered evidence of some kind of potential national security threat five years from now when a different president is in power? But isn't it worth it on this one level at the end of the day if we're, we're weighing these costs, which I think everything you just mentioned, people would say this is a cost, this is a cost to freedom of communication, to feeling secure in your own home. But police have powers that make us feel unsafe sometimes and they have that for good reasons uh, because there are people out there who want to hurt us. And in the case of terrorists, there are people out there with possibly nuclear weapons and it seems like a minor inconvenience to us might be worth this maximal cataclysmic event in the future. Right. Um, well, I mean, so certainly, uh, I think it's it's true in in, in the abstract that um, in order to protect people, whether from terrorists or from ordinary crime, uh, 
police or investigators, government agents sometimes need to investigate in ways that involve some incursion on personal privacy uh, and that, yeah, we have to make some trade-offs. Um, we need to, for example, decide that in order to catch murderers, sometimes police can gain, obtain search warrants and go into private homes of people who have not yet been convicted of anything uh, to obtain evidence and that's a trade-off we make. Um, I think there are two mistakes to avoid though. One mistake to avoid is because sometimes there's a trade-off between privacy and security, assuming that every loss of privacy is an increase in security or conversely that any gain in security requires uh, a radical diminution in privacy. Um, that, of course, I think is a mistake. And the other is to uh, in some sense act as though with respect to every particular invasion uh, proposed that the entire weight of the interest in national security is on the other side of the balance. I think you see the courts doing this a lot. They'll say, well, um, gathering people's phone metadata is an invasion of privacy but on the other side, nuclear bombs going off in New York. Um, and if every time a particular invasion of privacy is proposed, what is on the other side of the ledger is a nuclear bomb going off in New York City, um, privacy will always lose. But of course, it's never the case that that's actually the, the, the you know the nuclear bomb is the alternative in every case. But it is on twenty four. On twenty four, right, I yes. see that there uh, always the, is a nuclear weapon. The, the, and we know that they have it. The, the, the well known documentary Twenty Four <laughs> uh, has taught us this. But I would suggest we think in a more sophisticated way about marginal differences in probability. So what we should be asking is not um, you know is privacy more important or is security more important? Um, what we should be asking is, all right, if the annual uh, probability of an American dying in a terrorist attack is one in 20 million, um, then relative to a less intrusive and more particularized method of gathering data, um, how much is that probability reduced at the margin by something more intrusive? And what we've seen, I think, across the board for a lot of the programs that have been examined in detail is uh, when it comes down to it, the advantage in, in terms of intelligence, in terms of uncovering bad actors and preventing plots um, gained from bulk collection over more traditional targeted collection is – negligible and maybe non-existent. Um, there may be other contexts in which that's not true and some kind of larger scale collection actually gives you a very, very great advantage uh, and very significantly reduces uh, the probability of a successful attack. Um, but we just need to be, I think, more sophisticated about asking that question. If you're taking a very small probability um, that you have reduced to some manageable level by targeted kinds of surveillance and then it turns out that uh, the additional marginal reduction in that probability in involved if you instead of getting 100 people's phone records, get 100 million people's phone records um, is so small it's barely detectable, uh, you know, eight decimal places down, you say, well, that is, uh, that is an instance where the invasion of privacy and indeed the creation of an architecture for monitoring and surveillance um, is, you know, again, maybe also you think low probability, but a larger risk on the whole than the very, very tiny potential gain in security you're getting in trade. It sounds like a precautionary principle type of situation, whether in the sense of multiply some probability by any infinite harm, and the infinite harm always wins. The, the I, answer yeah. is always infinity, right? I think there is something like that. Of course, you you don't actually have infinities in in, yes, in, yeah. in the real world, but yeah, I mean, I think you, know, you, you when you think back to, um, I think it was Dick Cheney saying, if uh, if the risk of an attack succeeding is one percent, the government has to treat it as though it's a certainty. Um, you know, th that is a, a dangerous way of thinking. Although one that I think fits with our natural cognitive architecture, human beings are very bad at thinking about. Uh, about probabilities, um, we are, you know, more anxious about uh, a bomb. You know, if you th think about things that you actually find yourself fretting about, you know, um, people do worry about 
getting on a plane, oh, could there be a, you know, a bomb on it or um, is the person next to me a terrorist? Um, when, of course, the probability of, of dying that way is hugely less than the probability of, of dying in a car wreck on your way to pick up a, a pint of milk uh, from the corner store. Um, we overestimate risks that are very large and visible and dramatic, um, underestimate risks that are more mundane um, but actually much, much more likely to do us in. Uh, and so this natural tendency, I think, causes us to do things with respect to risks related to terrorism that we don't do in, in almost any other realm. I mean the precautionary principle comes from um, you know, the rhetoric of, of environmental regulation but but in fact, we don't do anything like this in the – um, in the environmental category. I mean if you had a, a, an environmental pollutant um, with a, a kind of average annualized risk of death uh, on par with terrorism, it would probably – the EPA wouldn't be allowed to do anything about it. In order it. to find it, they put a huge dragnet over the entire nation to make sure that occasionally someone doesn't use this pollutant that has this much. Yeah, that's an interesting analogy. Well, interesting. Uh, people seem to treat terrorism very differently from ordinary sorts of crime because if you took Dick Cheney's, if there's one percent chance we have to treat it like a hundred percent, well then, if we treated, uh, if we thought of murder that way. Because every, there's a certain percentage every day some American will be murdered, it would justify putting police officers in front of every house to make sure there are no break-ins or no assaults or anything like that. And I think you know, Trevor pointing out 24 reminds me of CSI, that the more these things get in the media, you can romanticize forensics and you can romanticize war and intelligence. And how sure and, we are about these things. Right, yeah. exactly. But I, I think if, if anything, these NSA revelations have uh, demonstrated lack of transparency and oversight and maybe uh, – uh, lack of success because I feel like if, there, if, we, if the NSA had prevented a nuclear attack or something, the first thing they would have done is uh, mention that they had done that using these systems, but they haven't. Uh, so, I mean, is that because they really couldn't if they really hadn't and we should trust them? Or is there another reason? They don't want to tip their hand possibly. Hmm. Right. I mean, well, so one, I, I, I actually don't think there are yet any terror groups that have, you know, put themselves in a position to actually – detonate a serious nuclear device, um, certainly not in the American homeland and maybe not anywhere um, in part just because fissile material is sort of hard to get your hands on. Um, I wouldn't necessarily um, assume that because they don't talk about specific attacks that they – that there aren't any um, for the for – the, not bad reason that, that yeah, you, you don't always want to give away how exactly – um, a plot was foiled. I mean very often, for example, let's say you foiled a particular terror attack because some weapon shipment didn't come through. You would much rather the group that you're spying on think that was just a stroke of bad luck or that the police investigators got lucky in checking that cargo than realizing that in fact um, their security has been compromised, that they have a mole inside, that their email accounts are being surveilled so that they stop using those accounts and shift to some other harder to track means of communication. So to some extent, I, I, I don't blame them for not wanting to um, go into detail about which um, attacks those are. And, and on the flip side, um, you know, if there are cases where an attack did fail for bad luck, um, you, but you're not surveilling that particular terrorist, so you actually want them to be paranoid um, that they are being surveilled and that they start wasting time by going through all sorts of more elaborate means to evade surveillance they're not under. So you never want to yeah, uh, give away too much about who is or is not uh, under successful surveillance. That said, um, they certainly have been willing to mention lots of particular cases. Uh, and when they do mention particular cases like the uh, Najib al uh subway bombing uh, plot and, and uh, other, uh, other cases like that, under scrutiny, they fall apart pretty quickly. So I, I do find it interesting that to the extent they have been willing to talk about lots of particular cases that they uh, have successfully foiled thanks to these elaborate NSA dragnets, um, once you have a few facts to cling to to start digging into what happened, uh, it turns out that those stories don't hold up to scrutiny. We're almost out of time. But for the, for the final question, I'd like to ask about just privacy in general because – uh, libertarians like to talk about privacy maybe more than a lot of people and there's a lot of people who say it doesn't really matter to them or they don't really think about it that much or you're being too paranoid. 
how should these lessons about the NSA make us think about privacy now and going forward with our new e-life that we're going to have? Anyone who's listening to this pretty much uh, is probably going to have an e-life for the rest of their life. So how, how should we start thinking about this and the government's uh, relationship to privacy? I mean, it's an odd fact about discussions of privacy that I think more than almost any other issue, we tend to use the language of fiction and often science fiction uh, to talk about our concerns, whether it's we say, well, this is pretty Orwellian or, wow, that was Kafkaesque um, or you know, more recently we might just say, well, this sounds like something out of Gary Scheingart's uh, super sad true love story, which is a fa fantastic modern uh, dystopian vision. And I think – the reason is in part that, uh, well, surveillance is by its nature something that occurs below the surface, something that is um, hard to see directly. The whole point is that you're, you're not aware of uh, how surveillance is operating often until it's too late, until it eventuates in a kind of massive privacy dystopia like East Germany under the Stasi. Um, I think the thing that's important to recognize is that we are at a sort of extraordinary technological moment when simultaneously there are capabilities to allow large-scale anonymous coordination uh, across huge spans of distance in a way that has never really been possible um, for hundreds of people to meet anonymously in a chat room and discuss uh, democratization or their – strange sexualities or any other topic that they would be afraid to uh, go out in the street and discuss publicly and at the same time creates uh, what has been called a golden age for surveillance, creates an architecture for granular monitoring of enormous number of people in a way that has just historically never been possible even under the Stasi in East Germany. Uh, 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 an architecture of surveillance where in effect automated systems, either private or public, may know things about you that you yourself do not know, can detect that you are under stress or becoming depressed from changes in your habits or schedule before you yourself detect them, can f spot the incipient signs of political rad radicalism uh, stirring in your soul before you yourself recognize what – road you're on. Um, and in the long term, I think the, the question we need to ask is not the short-term question, will this or that particular surveillance program or this or that invasion of privacy make us safer from those who would do us harm in a way that uh, uh, makes us a sensible trade-off this year or next year. The question I think we need to ask is that when these systems are taken together and integrated, as, as indeed they, they always are, um, as they already are, um, for these analytic purposes, when you imagine a network that is able of scoop, capable of scooping up so many disparate kinds of data about so many people and aggregating them to not just know what they're reading and thinking but to predict what they will be reading and thinking, is that kind of power to monitor and know populations compatible with a free and democratic society? Um, could a government with access to that architecture of monitoring um, effectively control its own population in a way that made it almost impossible to dislodge? Uh, and if the answer is that we think that they're not compatible in the long run, um, that a government with that architecture in place could shield itself from accountability, um, then we need to ask very carefully whether the short-term security we're purchasing is worth the candle. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode, you can find us on Twitter at FreeThoughtsPod. That's FreeThoughts, P-O-D. FreeThoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more, you can find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.